Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries, and this is the first of what I hope will be a sequence of videos called the Sunday Roleplay Ramble with myself and John Carvalho. So we're going to start off with a rambling topic about what makes a good role-playing game. So, John, as far as you're concerned, what would you say if you had to squeeze it down into a tiny nugget of information? What makes a good role-playing game? Um, it's impossible to squeeze it down into a tiny nugget of information. What I would say, I'd just like to introduce myself to the viewers and say, so my grounding for role plays is much more in storytelling and using role play as a device to exchange tales of heroism and daring do, or daring don't, as your players take it. Would you like to tell the viewers precisely how many role play books you've actually read? Although, obviously, I already know the answer to this question. What? Yeah, okay. just, just, just what? Do, do, do you choose your own adventure book? Uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, they do. They're, they're sort of solo role-playing experiences, aren't they? So. Yeah, I've done a lot of solo role-playing, or as I like to call it, using my imagination. Um, and as I've said in um, a few videos on the channel, obviously I've got a lot of books that are sort of behind me in all the videos, but the, the books really are just sort of like aids or like toolkits, really. They don't make your role-playing game, as you quite rightly say, that exists in your imagination. There's no need for all the books there, bro. I just use them as reference points and they're handy sort of pushing off points. Um, as you say, you've obviously made... I, I've played in many of your games that you've GM'd and uh, I know you've played in many other games quite successfully without having read a any of these books at all. So. What books take, do is they take a complete source for something. So say when they do a, a Rome GURPS or a Rome Vampire or a Rome Scion game, whatever it might be, what those books contain is the construct of the supernatural in our interplays with uh, that society. But it also gives you uh, a setting. It tells you about what amphitheatres were for. It tells you what coliseums were for, how common bathhouses were, the sort of things you'd see in a market street, the fact that slavery was quite a common practice, which are all great for flavour. Me, what I've always tended to do is, rather than go to a source book, uh, I've tended to read a number of source books and borrow, well, let's say acquire um, bits from each and, and try and draw that into my game. So when I did a, uh, a zombie apocalypse game, uh, I sat down and the first thing I saw, thought of was, OK, what do I want to do here? And I wanted to take the actual players that I played with as them through what would happen to them if it was a zombie apocalypse. And some people may say, well, that's not role playing, but you are, you're playing yourself in an unknown situation, which was where the role play came from. But what I did with that was I read probably 10, 15 zombie, I borrowed a few of yours, um, and watched hours and hours of zombie films. You know, it's, it's a pressing job, but somebody's got to do it. And I could have chosen one zombie book that gave me uh, the Romero type zombie or or some other source book that listed a plague or something similar that we just interposed one supernatural condition or disease with another. But I chose to look much wider than that. So I, I don't own any books apart from one which my good friend John bought me, which is why he knows I've read one book, because he got sick and tired of me saying I'd read no books. I'd try and sneak a bit of a book in there, you know, yeah. under the radar. And I have to say, though, I read that book. I enjoyed the system. Um, it's active exploits. Uh, do we do name dropping in these? Oh, yeah, feel free. I mean, I, I, I played in the game briefly. Very enjoyable system. It's so, a well, points allocation system, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, points allocation with a bidding system, and you would uh, declare at the start of scenes or sessions what your character aims were and there would be points uh, returned for that and points returned for arduous tasks completed and then you could take those points and either use them as experience points or as bidding points within the game. Um, so I really liked the system but then I just in interposed a fantasy world over the top and try and use that system. Yeah I mean I quite like the, I quite like the mechanics that were in play in it because um, the whole idea of you actually getting better at what 
skills you possessed as you were using them rather than just getting a bulk load of XP at the end of the session and distributing it I thought was quite good. I thought it was a system that was better for proactive players and sort of more sort of high role play players basically because it like you say it did rely on you setting character goals for yourself and then trying to achieve them. Whereas I think if you're more sort of a player who stepped back or a bit of a sort of wallflower, it wouldn't really be a system that would suit you because you wouldn't really be gaining that XP, would you? Whereas some of the other systems, if you were a bit of a wallflower but the group got XP at the end of the session, you'd still be sort of progressing. Whereas with the active exploits, unless you're out doing your goals, you don't really sort of advance, which... If wallflowers, as you term them, or, or baggage, as I term them, why, why are they in a game if they don't wish to take... Uh, an active part um, it's a bit like showing up to an orgy and sitting on the sidelines I mean it's just not fair on everybody else who's actively taking the part for your character to then get return at the end of a session in the form of being able to buy that next level power um, or put it towards your next character gen if John's just killed your character again what, why should they get the return when they've played some um, I don't know, they've had seven points out of you at the start to play Floors that they haven't then played. They've then gone through the game ignoring the temptations that have been thrust in their way specifically designed for their character. And then, at the end of it, for you to go, oh, right, so you didn't do any of the actual role play, here's some experience points. Well, they've got no experience other than, yeah, I sat around with some mates for a few hours and watched them role play. No, I have to agree there. I mean, one of the things I, I like about the, the Dungeon World system that I've been playing a lot recently is you do get sort of like a small amount of XP on a session basis, but added to that, there's basically like a series of questions that you as a GM ask to the group at the end. And if you want sort of like, a, have you role played your alignment? And there's very clear guidelines on what qualifies as role playing your alignment. Um, so if it's a paladin, it might be something like help to the weak and defenseless. And if you say, oh, yes, I have, and you, you have, and everyone agrees, you get an extra XP. And you basically go through this list of questions. If you say no to them, you don't get the XP. Which sounds to me to be uh, very reasonable, uh, but I would say in practice would not work because roleplay tends to be a social gathering of people, and it's rare you find somebody in the middle of a roleplay, some chode at the end, who's going to say, oh, I thought you were a bit crap, actually. People tend to do his band together and go, oh, yeah, I, I thought... Uh, I've heard it said when people say, oh, if you nominate me for this point, I'll nominate you for that point. Well, that's not roleplay, people. That's cheating on the test. I think, I think you're right there. There is a certain amount of you have to be careful with that. However, I think that's the place where the, the GM has to step in. So I certainly know when I'm running a dungeon mode game, if someone says, oh, well, I think, um, I think perhaps this, and I obviously don't think they've roleplayed, I'll just go, well, no, no, you're not having that XP. Oh, but this is the character killer. No, to be, to be fair to John, he, he tends to work uh, within the uh, ascribed rules and remits and makes good showing of, of those middle-level supernaturals, those people with perhaps some element of ability who uh, find themselves in a world where people have so much more ability. Um, and then the mooks, the humans, the minions, whatever people uh, you can and fodder, whatever people like to turn them they sort of do disappear in the background and you do have the edge but often players find themselves pushing situations because they have this edge against minions and they suddenly you know some um, some high ranking official turns up and you've always got somebody at the back saying oh I'm going to smack him and it's it's uh, a little bit disruptive sometimes uh, the, 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 the lesson I try to take away or try to give to role players is don't fight everything how many situations do you come across where the f person's first response because they're a combat character? Because that's what they do all day, every day. They see something, they fight it. Good God. Yeah, because they're a combat character, they can't restrain that for the briefest iota while somebody explains, oh, you've just entered this person's land and my lord would appreciate it if you would turn up and present yourselves like good children. Then send this head back in a box! It, it, it's something I find quite irritating. When it's very disruptive. Yeah, because yeah, an NPC, I don't, I, people at home, how do you design your NPCs? Um, 
I'm a wee bit mental, so I tend to give them a little bit of a backstory, think to myself, okay, what makes them as individuals? Why are they there? It's not, it's not really mental. I think that's probably the way you should design NPCs, unfortunately not always the case. Well, it's like with your, your basic Castle Guard. Let me give you a couple of instances of Castle Guard, right? So, did they join the Watch because their dad was in the Watch? Therefore, are they devout to the uh, rituals of the Watch and the functions of the Watch and the operating procedures of the Watch? Or, did they get drunk one night, um, one of the mates joined the Watch, they woke up, found themselves bound to the Watch in a time when militia were garnered together. So, are they in it and always looking for a way out? Not too bothered about. So sort of like conscripts, yeah. sort of thing. Or are they uh, a sergeant that's perhaps on the take, or, a, or a, a, any guard that's on the take? And you know, is it possible with crossing their palm with a bit of silver that you may gain through the door? Of course, there is always the free asset of smacking them. But how many times do we make? these roles and they don't go so well and all of a sudden the alarm is raised and people fall at the first hurdle because their instant thing is to is to smack them now even if they are a really officious official and say I'm a guard I'm not letting you through there is nothing wrong with walking away from that guard and seeking another way of entry well I mean I think and, and I know you've read sort of far more military history and sort of historical based fantasy than myself but even the the sort of what are considered to be like the greatest warriors in history knew when to pick their battles. They didn't, they didn't just go charging blindly and attacking like every like peasant they saw walking by the side of the road or whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and turn this into some sort of treatise on, ah, oh, Sun Tzu is the art of war. Uh, but there I like are. Well, your name dropped in a book that you've read there. Yeah, well, you, you, you sometimes. That's all that book is, is a reference book about previous historical mistakes or well-won victories that have happened and what created that particular edge. And a lot of them have the combined feature of thinking about it before you do it. That there, there is nothing wrong with sitting around and planning for a few minutes, but planning and sticking to it. How many times do we, do we plan and then all of a sudden go, we, we, we go up to that guard, right, we're, we're going to... We're just going to go past that guard, we'll bribe him and get through. Oh, he won't take a bribe, so I smacked him. Oh, no, the alarm's gone off. Now, steps two, three, four, and five, and six of our plan are all to part, and we're improvising. I am conscious you actually asked the question, what makes a good role No, that's player. fine. I was just going to say that um, I also find that part of the problem of that whole just sort of like rapidly attacking everything is that it also tends to, the people who tend to do that, not always, but quite a lot of the time, tend to be the sort of people who, when combat starts, role-playing stops and it just becomes like a dice-rolling yeah, exercise. Oh, yes. Yeah. Which, I, I've no, I'm not saying that combat can't be role-playing intensive. Obviously, you can describe what your character's doing. You can act out, you know, the sort of injuries you've received, like holding your shoulder if you've been shot with an arrow, just to give a ridiculously simple example. But that sort of person who tends, oddly enough, that sort of person who tends to want to jump into combat all of the time, regardless of the situation, in my experience, tends to be the person who, once combat starts, it's just like a screen's drop down, like role play is over, time to roll some dice. Whereas I don't think the two are really mutually exclusive, to be honest. Well, for me, it, it ruins your immersion a little bit, but I split them up into two types of coffee lover. You have the Nescafs of this world who like to magic the beans constantly by their, oh, I've rolled a double six, yay! We're in a D20 system, can you just put those dice down, please? I mean, for God's sake, we're in the middle of a scene. Um, and then there's the gold blend lovers of this world. Now, what the gold blend adverts were about the long-term storyline, the long-term plot. He's moved in next door. Oh, God, he's, he's run out of coffee. I think that's probably the first time anyone's described the gold blend adverts as like a long-term <laughs> plot or any plot at all. Look, Anthony Stewart Head doesn't get a great deal of work after doing Giles. So, oh, you know, right, fair enough. I, I, I'm sure he appreciates your effort to like push his career forward. And, and, and Mr. Stewart Head, if you are watching, I thought you were very good in Doctor Sarcasm doesn't come a well across on this well, does it? <laughs> well, to, be, to be fair, I did like him in Doctor Who. Oh, I thought those... We're going to go off topic. Warning, warning, yeah. warning. Let, let, let's pull it back to like ro actual roleplay. Mm. Sorry. That's all right. I believe we we're about to go back to the, the topic of like what makes a good game. Well, which I is thought this was going to become a bit like how I met your mother in the fact we may not ever actually answer the question because it's one of those unanswerable ones, but we might lead you dallying through eight series of... <gasps> no. So are, are you trying to say that it was going to be like one of those terrible like, reality TV shows where they're like, oh, it's been an incredible journey. <laughs> I remember the first role play I ever did. 
I was a tiger and my mum, we were at the zoo. And I sat on the floor about two going... Um, no. There are different types of role-play games. So sometimes we set up what we call campaigns, what you may call chapters, what you may call whatever name, a long running game with centrally themed characters. What makes that a good role play will be completely different to what we did something called one-off Wednesdays as well, where we ran one-off games. You've probably diarised it. Yeah, yeah, I've diarised a number of them, yeah. Uh, that's right. He's got his own jargon. So, you, you, the short one-off games, what makes them successful, will at points be a complete antithesis uh, to what makes another type of game successful. Um, I've also attempted a universal view game where I took... Uh, two characters, three characters from neonate uh, vampires through an entire end of the world because they're immortal beyond the meeting of alien species, the first contact points, etc. Just to explain quickly to anyone who's not as conversant in sort of World of Darkness vampire, neonate is literally those vampires who have just transitioned from human to vampire. What? Do I need a glossary of terms? Well, you know, the, the, much as I'm sure like most people by now are like familiar with the, the World of Darkness terminology, there may still be some people out there who've not actually played a World of Darkness game. I know, I know it seems uh, Sorry, almost was, impossible given our experience. I was, was going to say WAD terminology. Is that not... Is that oh, not I, 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 you're not it, down it, with the WAD? Oh, well, you know what? It's called OWAD now, the original... Well, no, I, I, they started off calling it OWAD, which was Old World of Darkness, and NWAD, which was New World of Darkness. But now, because you can get all the Old World of Darkness books now on print-on-demand... They started terming it as CWOD, I think it is, which sounds a bit like a sort of swear word abbreviation to me, but I think it's Core World of Darkness or something. Or well, what amazes me is in the early 90s, they'd actually got a prequel in there, as it was called Aswad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's Seal. <laughs> I think we've found the first edit point, John. <laughs> so I think Aswad was what is love, wasn't it? Don't do it at me. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and I've made a, a galactic game where somebody went through to, an individual went through to rule the universe for all intents and purposes. And what's made them all good games or not as the case may be is understanding what you're actually setting out to achieve. So if I was to run a, a one-off roleplay, uh, I tend to make you high-powered to begin with. It's a one-off game. Why not use the powers that are written? Uh, and I know you disagree from letting anybody have any powers. Um, but yeah, I tend to give them people powers. No, I mean, one-off game. I, I think that's I think that's very sensible. I mean, if you're if you're playing a long-running campaign, you can obviously start off at lower power levels with the understanding that as the campaign progresses, you'll get to use the sort of like the higher level powers as you go on, and you'll see that sort of gradual power build. Whereas obviously, if you're playing a one-off game, you haven't got that time to build it up. And let's face it, if you're playing not to sound like a power game or anything, but if you are playing a vampire, you want to be able to do like vampire stuff, don't you? It's like playing a superhero and then going, oh, I, I don't want to take any superhero power, so why bother playing a superhero game? Yeah, my power is nonchalant. That's it, yeah. Oh, I've, got, <laughs> I've got a power of ambivalence. Yeah. How's that working out for you? Uh, <laughs> oh, my God, is it a bird or is it laissez-faire? <laughs> oh, I like that as a name for a superhero. <laughs> laissez-faire. <laughs> Sounds like a sequel to a dog film. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what makes a good short game to one person can be uh, different to another person. But if you're going to do a short game, um, do you need a plot? Here's an interesting question for you. You're doing a one-off. You just drop some people in the middle of your one-off system. That's where you are. Now, if it's a one-off and not everybody's like familiar with the source material, to run a plot within that world where there's some knowledge... Sorry, st stop tapping your lighter. Uh, if you run the plot in, in a world where you need some knowledge of how the races, how the society, how the politics, whatever it might be, interacts, do you need a plot? So I'll try and put this into uh, an example for you. Um, you're playing with people that have got no concept of... Uh, elves versus orcs. They've never seen a Lord of the Rings movie. Um, they've never played out any Ian Livingston or Steve Jackson classic. People go out and buy them. They're great fun. I've got some of my spot. I've got a lot of collection. Um, 
So yeah, you drop them into that world, and then your plot is the elf king has been poisoned, and they found an orcish dart by the body, right? Well, to somebody without those reference points, that well-crafted... See, see the time I spent on that plot, John? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that well-crafted plot is going to be completely lost on them. It's not going to cross their mind that, oh, uh, there's a group called the Dark Elves that actually... Uh, so let's just complex it up a bit. I know as a GM and as somebody within that genre of familiarity, one of my thoughts would be, is somebody setting up the Orcs? That seems a little bit too easy for me. So, do I just wander out now? Here's where you get your nest calf role players. They go out, the first orc they see, a magic in the beans! We 19! Yeah. The orcs are responsible. I've come across an orc. Uh, that's, that, that's that problem dealt with. Yeah. Whee! Where's my XP? But back in time for Team Crumpets. Uh, meanwhile, what you didn't see in the shadows was a dark elf with his hood pulled over and his slightly pallid skin from where he doesn't spend time in the dappled forest, looking over, weighing a money purse in his hand. It's so it's something well, it's for me. It's different levels of yeah. plot, isn't it? If you're going to do a plot and it's for a one-off game, try not to make it a, so much about that type of game. Try and make it a plot that everyone's familiar with. So, for example, everybody's familiar with King's Daughter being ransomed. Everybody's familiar with a group of terrorists have stolen a boat. Everybody's familiar with enough plot lines which you can actually use. Just you know, take terrorists for dark elves, take boat for yeah, elves. Put a fantasy spin on it, yeah. or, or whatever genre you're doing. Yeah, don't you? T take King and turn it into a uh, a, a, a vampire ruler, and take daughter to mean um, his childer. And kidnappers are werewolves. Yeah, um, you can do the same for like science fiction, like the the, the boat napping. Oh, maybe it's um, like a luxury space liner. And oh, like the... in the Doctor Who Christmas episode that I didn't like. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe, maybe a bit like that coincidentally. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, if you're going to do a one-off. Do you make it about plot? Is there any point in making it about plot? How long is your one off? Have you got two and a half hours of role play, or have you got two and a half hours of shits and giggles and role play? I, I think what I what I tend to do when I'm doing a one off is I tend to I come up with, as you say, a very sort of basic plot, and I normally try and use a, a setting and a plot that everyone can sort of instinct instinctively sort of relate to because they're familiar with it. And then I, I pretty much drop them in, and I let them. I just see where it goes. To, to be perfectly honest, uh, I don't come up with a strictly sort of like linear plot, but I do try and not make it as multi-layered as I would do in a long-running campaign. Because I haven't got time to explore all those extra well, yeah, avenues. Ex exactly, and that brings us round to the idea of a long-running campaign. So, in a long-running campaign, one thing I would anticipate is the gaining of power throughout the story, be that through XP, be it through discovering magical items. Yeah. Some sort of character it, progression, yes. whether it be stats or sort of role-play elements. Um, or for both. example, uh, there's a number of the Aswad, Seawad, Owad, Wad books um, that have these metamorphoses for their supernatural creatures for example there used to be this thing I don't know if there is in the new world of darkness and again I've not read any of the books this is all hearsay for me uh, but what I understood was as a cub uh, as a human you might go through a series of nightmares or emotional trauma and that emotional trauma would lead to uh, the awakening or whatever it's referred this, to this is for werewolves yeah yeah, yeah um, basically you you, you've always been a werewolf because you're a separate sort of species to humanity, but you don't really realise, and either in times of stress or normally around about sort of like puberty or all the changes the body's going through, they they start to experience these strange things, which are the spirit world effectively taking notice of them as their their Aratha or Garu, depending on what edition you're looking at. Heritage starts to sort of like manifest itself. So there, there are a number of books where you would go through a metamorphosis. It could be as a vampire. They have this uh, process being embraced where another vampire turns them into a vampire. Uh, I believe that mage have an awakening. Yeah, depending on what, what um, which of the editions it is, they either 
they, they, they both sort of have a slightly different packaged version of the awakening where they they awaken to the knowledge that reality is more malleable than normal people would be led to believe and that they can shape it with their powers and their beliefs. And would it be fair to say that wraiths had a point when they were alive? Well, wraiths, wraiths are a little bit different. Um, Wraith t- obviously starts off like just after your character has like died in the mortal world. But um, they, they have this very sort of symbolic thing called coming out of the call which is that they awaken, they're almost in sort of like a birthing sack of like ectoplasmic energy. And when you first die, you appear in that, in the Shadowlands, and then you sort of, you're almost reborn into like the afterlife. So that's their sort of awakening. And the rest of the game really focuses around sort of coming to terms with that and like the sort of baggage you've left behind in your mortal life. So th- there are a whole heap of supernatural characters which aren't born supernatural as their character. So there is potential to talk about the time when they were less. That time when they were less, um, is it Dungeon World? I think they have a whole solution to the character generation where they discuss their interactions as characters prior to the game. They, they make up scenes. Is that right or is that fate? Uh, it's it's fate that does that. Um, fate has a, you sort of come up with a number of adventures that you've been involved in as a sort of like prelude to the actual game. So any, any prelude add some value so if you're doing a campaign game i actually like to take things from the time before you were a supernatural just so people get an idea for themselves as to how um how much they how how powerfully they felt perhaps about what they become before they become it so somebody before they became a vampire what was their attitude towards the supernatural world that might be worthwhile exploring for a campaign and it might have to give you future plot potentially with uh outer level occult members they've they've met with i mean an awful lot an awful lot of role play books certainly the, the world of darkness books they have whole sections based around sort of running the prelude and as you say it does add a lot of value for later on in a long running game well the, if we look at the defining features between a one-off game and a campaign game one thing that's just struck me and this is a genuine Sunday ra- role play ramble John and I tend to uh, sit together his wife's gone at work I'll perhaps have my son with me who, who likes to join in this debate he's 11 um, Elliot name drop hello uh, um, uh, if you're looking at the differences between it it strikes me that fate would be a very good system if you're going to do a series of one offs because it gives you the chance to perhaps articulate some of those prelude moments prior to the game and ergo give your characters oh do you remember that time in oh it's like Cambodia out there oh do you remember oh, makes makes Kentucky like, like Alabama or some similar I, I think as well just to like push um, the fact that like fate is very good for like one offs is the fact that when you create a character in fate yeah you're right I do love fate when you create a character in fate you're you start off as very competent right from the get go which as we were saying earlier that's what you want in a one-off game you haven't got the time to sort of work from like a basic apprentice up to like being the master you want to sort of start off sort of reasonably powerful so you can jump straight into the action and get cracking on with it and fate sort of has that as its default setting basically well i remember the excitement that used to come with um the saving <laughs> this sound really boring now yeah the saving at the experience points to achieve a particular power you've been waiting to buy and quite often when people uh, or certainly when I've generated characters I've generated characters with future power ideas in mind so thinking of the character and what they'd be like with that power and maybe as something that drives them so again to give that a excuse me a context imagine yourself you were an apprentice at work you've designed the character to be a master carpenter but you start the game as an apprentice and then there comes that moment where you, you've done enough time as an apprentice and somebody comes and grants you the rank of journeyman or whatever um, and that gives you then the ability to make your own tables and put your own name on it now okay that's a very uh, a very easy sort of uh, analogy to try and use or the idea of somebody who works as a, a washer up in a kitchen and eventually goes on to, on, on to own their own chain of restaurants now there'll come a point where the bank gives 
gives them the backing or whatever. So there's there's a point where the character has a celebratory moment of uh, transiting from one state to another, and you actually then begin to perhaps play the character you originally had in mind. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, I tend to do likewise when I create a character. I sort of even if you create and get it at low levels for a campaign you create it with a sort of end goal in mind you, you've almost got a sort of vision of how they might end up when they are more powerful I think a lot of that comes from reading fiction though because even if you if you read a book and at the start of the book one of the main characters is a, a sort of fairly low down in terms of sort of power or societal standing inevitably as the book progresses they progress along with it and you, you can m- most books you certainly fantasy books uh, you can see you can almost see sort of where a character is going to go. Like if someone starts off and they're, they're like an apprentice wizard, like just like working in a little village, you can guarantee as the journey goes on they're going to become a more powerful wizard to they're sort of like a big power player at the end. Yeah. Normally, not always, but uh, I, I think that sort of character journey, certainly for campaigns, is very important and it, it's always worth bearing in mind. So obviously if you're going to be playing a character for a long period of time, you want it to be entertaining to you in the long run so having some sort of goal to work towards gives you something to look forward to well I also like to see things resurface as well um, as I have mentioned earlier you know my style of role play is not just walk up to something and smack it to get through a door um, so I'll often introduce in, in games a character an NPC which if treated in the right way later on in the story, your paths will cross again, and then, depending on how your first interaction went, will drive that second interaction. So, uh, I used to love that moment uh, when John and I have had uh, many discussion about choose your own adventure books. Um, I don't cheat at choose your own adventure books. If I turn the page, I'm there, I'm done. If I die, I'm done, I have to re start. Whereas John's a keep your form in the previous page kind of guy. Um, so when looking at these choose your own adventure books uh, you'll often read something and then it say oh right so if you choose to give him the, the five gold pieces to go and free his daughter or whatever um, turn to page 292 and then you turn to page not a real book I'm just making up numbers obviously uh, you turn there and then it will go oh right okay and his gratitude he gives you a silver locket turn back to page 198 whatever oh right brilliant fantastic I mean I think in I think for myself uh, it, it was it was always less about sort of the actual game aspect with um, choose your own adventure books. It was more the eye because most of the ones that I've read were when I just started role playing. And I think with me the sort of the fascination was that you had these different paths that you could take. So for me, sort of like keeping the finger in the book was less about sort of like winning combats and whatever. It was more about going, oh, I'm actually, yes, yeah. It was more about actually going, um, all right. So I've, I've given him the gold. It, it's going to do that and that, but. How much difference would it have made if I'd not given him that gold? Because that, that was like my first lead into role play, where ostensibly you can make any sort of decision you want. Yeah, you're choosing your own adventure. Exactly. exactly it's, yeah. it's almost like the books are designed for oh, that. Yeah, I know. Uh, but um, I, I always like the idea of um, <laughs> rather than just like one. Although you like you follow one path and that either gets you to like your ignoble death or your like heroic triumph. Normally in these books, it was always the idea of well, if I only go through it one way. I've obviously only read like a small portion of the book, really, and yeah, you can go through it again and you can make different choices, etc., which is great for like replay value. I always like to sort of like read a couple of sections either side as I was going along, just to like almost like you know if you see like a TV series where it's like sort of like alternate realities and you can see like what would have happened if like history had diverged, almost like that. Fringe is a fantastic example of this. Yeah, very true. And that, that, that was one of the main bits of enjoyment for me. So, sort of like reading along, going, oh, yeah, I've taken this main path, but if I'd have chose to go that way, it might have ended up differently in this manner, it might have ended up differently in that manner. And I think that's informed a lot of my role players. I've done it over the years. So, setting it so your plots don't just have like a, a, a win or a lose condition, but there's numerous like different branches coming off it. And obviously, you don't write out all of them because that'd be ridiculous. But you create enough detail and you set enough sort of background material in there that you can actually work with these different branches and sort of have them run off. Yeah, it's another bugbear of mine, and I know John uh, does a uh, bit about his own role play bugbears. I've given him a couple of ideas in the past, and I am indeed a subscriber to John's channel. Um, but it's that it's that choice of fight 
to the death. Everybody, you know, you, you say fight, and everybody, every Nescafe role player in the world, I'm, bla I'm blatantly stealing that. Just wants to, you know, pick up the dice and go to the death. Why to the death? Why? Wh where does this idea come that every interaction in a role play game, every scene, every spoken word, is um, an unreturnable tree diagram? So it's going to take you off into some mad route that is a yes-no situation. It's almost like uh, role plays become binary, and there's only yeah. probably ten people out there that would understand that joke. Um, but it's almost like role players become binary, and it, that every situation is a yes-no, yes-no. My win condition is kill everybody. My win condition is get that barmaid upstairs. Well, my win condition might actually be to get through this scene and into another scene where it's going to be easier for me to kill that person or easier for me to get that barmaid into bed. Why do we... The, people tend to look at scenes and go, right, everything has to happen in here. Um, yes, yeah, so you're talking about potentially um, setting up an outcome so a few scenes beforehand and so having a scene where that sort of pay off. Well, but, yeah, Choose Your Own Adventure books are an, a fantas are fantastic... Are you getting sponsored by, like, Choose Your Own Adventure books? Example, no. I'm using them as a type of role-play game. Your question was, what makes a good role-play game? True. Yeah, I bet he edits out that. Um, so, yeah, you've got a Choose Your Own Adventure book, and you go through it, and there might be three ways to get to the castle in the book. One way you turn up on a white charger with a couple of like harems of women in tow, uh, or guys, or whatever you poison, uh, and a you know a truck full of treasure. Yeah. Boop. Boop. yeah for, for those fantasy realms where like dumper trucks are the <laughs> yeah, yeah. the prevailing the method of transportation. Transport. Yeah. 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 Predate banks, dumper trucks. Um, or you could arrive at the uh, at the castle under the cover of darkness, tired but concealed and having picked up a magical sword or you can arrive at the castle um, having been mugged on the way got into a fight where you've lost three health levels and you're at the trap door shouting to uh, there are only three plausible ways to the to the castle because it's in it's in the format of a book but in a role play there are a myriad ways of being to the castle and I think sometimes we see uh, as, 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 story, as, as role players we can be very guilty of seeing short sighted steps um, I enjoy logic machine puzzles um, and I always try and look for okay to get the guard away do we have to fight him no is there a female in our company and I'm not just being stereotypical but let's just say the guard is male just for ease of traditional purpose oh there isn't a female in our company oh well we can't trick them away could we not? Could one of us not passingly dress as a female? Is it dark? Could one of us perhaps slip a barmaid a few coins to go and and there's a bottle of wine go and lure that guard away? And all of a sudden you might find yourself into the castle without actually the need for a test taking place. Because you've given your GM no possible way that's games master. You're giving your GM... I think most people are familiar <laughs> with the terminology GM, John, but thanks. No possible way to say, oh, that won't work. Your GM might have a role behind his, behind his or her screen. They might go, OK, um, I'll roll some charisma or whatever your system you're using for the barmaid. They even might roll some self-control for the guard. Um, but fundamentally, I think it's another plausible way to get into a castle without it just being, oh, let's fight our way through. Let's I think, try and I think as well, I mean, through. certainly one of the things I've noticed is I, I quite enjoy talking to an NPC. I mean, I mean obviously, it, yeah. it, it depends on the, the character you're playing. Like, obviously, if I'm playing some sort of, like, burly sort of fighter who, like, doesn't really do a great deal, but fight, he's dedicated to, like, his cause and whatever, I'm probably less conversant. But if I'm playing a character who's, like, like most people are willing to talk to people, then I, I quite enjoy talking to NPCs and I find that quite often GMs will sort of seed those NPCs with little bits of background information. It might not be something that's relevant to the plot, but it might just be something that like 
sets off a, a different bit of the world or they might let you know that oh, there's a, a harvest festival going on in their town or whatever just gives you a bit of extra detail but it's all like you said earlier adding value to your sort of your role playing experience because you, you're finding out a bit more about it and I find genuinely most GMs will sort of slip you a few extra hints if you're doing that because obviously they're getting to reel out some of the ideas they've got and they get time in a, a bit of fun and relax just having a bit of a conversation rather than as you say just going in and going oh that, that peasant's giving me the eye well, just using your example you've mentioned a harvest festival in the area so I don't know if my mind works differently to other people's but I've just sat there and thinking okay so there's bound to be some wine about wine's good for intoxicating people there's plenty of food about because it's all been bought in um, is it possible to poison some of that food there might even be farm equipment knocking about uh, improvised weapons men yeah. having finished the harvest and women having finished the harvest with coin in their purse because they've been paid uh, market sellers travelling with carts so is there a chance oh, I want to steal an oxen uh, take that into a different setting make it a 21st century the world we live in setting oh so there's a harvest festival ok are there any parades you know um, harvest is different things to different cultures and we live in a diverse world so uh um, are there any particular other denominations that could be bought in at this particular time for everybody? I think as well if you if you take that into a sort of far future sort of sci-fi setting, you know, sort of like modern day fantasy and sci-fi being what I think is probably the three most prevalent sort of sections. The Trinity. Yeah, the Holy Trinity. Then um, you, you can take that even further because obviously as you say it's a very diverse world we live in. Fantasy worlds are fantasy races. Harvests mean and various different festivals mean different things to different people. If you expand that into potentially a universe full of alien species oh, yeah. sort of coming together for like a multicultural sort of festival, then you you've already got even more possibilities. I mean you think about things like um, Babylon five and Star Trek DS9, where they've got sort of central places where all these different alien races come together and uh, that sort of clash of different cultures and that sort of how they learn to get on or not as the case may be with each other. That that's just spewing blot out basically. Well, I've just thought of uh, an old but not yet tired antagonist type to use, locusts. Uh, a locust people that travel from world to world at times of harvest and plenty. And nobody's come across them before because guess what, the other people died. Uh, and suddenly on the outer reaches then they've turned up. Oh, celebrating harvest. You've then got, what, three, four years, five years of doing a space game to prepare as they start romping their way across. Oh, you mean you, you've not got the old classic in like a role-playing game where like, an NPC's like telling you a story and they're like, oh, I remember when the locust people came to um, SETI Alpha 5 and uh, no one survived their onslaught. Really? How do you know about it then? No one. Just define <laughs> no one yeah. for me. No one at all. So what, they, they, they sent a message into space just before they died or something, did they? How? So captain's driving ship. Ba, ba, ba. Did you hear that? Um, but back to the point you were making it's one of those things if you ever play a game like Final Fantasy 7 on a, on a console or something like that Final Fantasy 10 their NPCs they do litter with little nuggets of information about how to find other things but I always find it frustrating and sometimes funny to just keep going back up and you know, talk to them again and again and you get the same response until eventually I think they build into it but with something where they go something like will you go away uh, but with your with your NPCs in uh, a role play, be it tabletop, live action, mind's eye, whatever you're poison, with your NPCs you've got a brilliant ability to just continue talking because they're a person actually there. It's, it's superior to a choose your own adventure book where the script is you know pre written, or to a game where it's pre written, or to a card game where there's a random chance, but you can have a cycle and then you've gone through them all. Or uh, a random encounters list where, again, there's a chance it will always be different, but you are going to cycle through them all at some point, uh, statistically, if you roll enough the dice. Um, so, with doing it via conversation, as a GM, I often give away bits of plot, which I think may be just to guide them somewhere, or because they had a chance to get it earlier and they just decided to kill that guard, and I really do need to give them this piece of plot. That, that as well, and you can also potentially sort of litter in like uh, seeds for future plots if you do like a long running game. So say like the the old man you meet at the the harvest festival, who's uh, one of the the local sort of crop producers, tells you that um, his farm's on the outskirts, and they've like they've had a few problems with like raiders recently. Like, Are we now writing again? Yeah, we, 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 oh, we, okay. we, we do seem to be doing. Uh, but uh, 
he says that there's been like, raiders coming down from the mountain and stealing his animals. He, he's never seen any of them, but he's found like some of the the, the corpses of his animals, or he's uh, he's chased off these shadowy figures. What state of the corpses in? Well, there you go. There, there's a, there's a number. Okay, of... these corpses are dehydrated. All that's left is skin and bone. It's a sort of withered husk. Yeah, and the uh, if they investigate, and here's a little GM thing, if they investigate, they find out the marrow's taken from inside the bone as well. If they don't, it, you just know it as GM. And the way these uh, locust things eat is via um, some sort of pubiscus that they stick inside the skeleton and basically suck all the nutrition out until you're left with... So, we're, up, so we're almost talking about some sort of vampiric style entity, but rather than drinking blood, they're actually like sucking like the the moisture, the fluids out of the body. That's quite interesting because when's this game set? It's set in a time beyond first contact, so it suggests man has travelled the stars. Vampires are immortal creatures. Um, in the World of Darkness games, they take uh, Cain from the Cain Mabel power, uh, story to uh, be the progenitor of all vampires, um, or if you just say some supernatural curse, or Count Dracula was the first, or Countess Bathory, or... Any number of historical yeah, figures. Uh, all could potentially be the first, but a vampire being immortal, um, one thing that holds back technology is the fact that our scholars have a limited lifespan. So this, this vampire scholar actually mastered the ability to space travel in... Uh, Victoriana, Victorian England. In fact, it's where uh, Jules Verne observed it, and that's where he got his one of his ideas for his stories from. Just as a bit of bit of yeah. flavour, flavour, bit of history. Yeah, yeah, that vampire went off into space, and then, because we're now set in uh, a future, say two million years down the line, a million years, five hundred thousand years, genetic engineering. These are what remains of some sort of outer reaches vampire plant. So now. Um, they have that they, they take the nutrition out of a vampire, but do they have any weaknesses of a, va- of a vampire? I mean, you've even got the possibility of obviously you're suggesting genetic engineering as why they they're now these locust type creatures. Well, obviously with it being a sort of science fictiony setting, you've obviously got the option of uh, do do they actually look like these uh, these locust style things? Because obviously you'd assume that it's like just some evolved form of protein, perhaps. Well, well, a, a vampiric dis- or even uh, a vampiric form changing. Even just to use technology, is it effectively like um, an exo so, armored yeah. suit? Because you'd assume that vampires vampires have, like Daleks, you mean? Yeah, you'd assume that if they've um, they've gone out and, and sort of colonized space, they've obviously come across other species and either been able to turn them into vampires or not. Which, if that's the case, you'd assume they don't all look the same unless they're using some sort of power. But if, if however, they, they're all sort of climbing into these like exo-armoured suits that maybe shield them from the sun and some of their other various weaknesses, protecting the heart, etc. And maybe they maybe it's the suit that siphons the various nutrients they need, so it removes some of the reliability on blood, but also you don't want to take away all the weaknesses because feeding is like an inherent part of being a vampire. It's when you're at, you, you are vulnerable, not, not, not without making it... There's no known change. But so maybe you are they've distracted um, during maybe period. they've sort of they've researched it and they've discovered what precise nutrients it is in blood that they require to survive, and they've built this suit to enable them to more efficiently sort of draw every last drop out of a person. All right, can I just ask? We stick to a, pubi- uh, a proboscis though, and not a plunger. Yeah, that's fine. Because I think a plunger is perhaps going to or an egg. With. It's been done anyway. Yeah. Oh look, people so fly. Oh yeah, that, that dog is amazing. Just call the step. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> so we've got vampire locusts living in the outer reaches, and the reason they're in the outer reaches were they escaping the sun. These suits now allow them to actually be in sunlight, so they're able to come back. That's why they're coming back from the outer reaches. Um, so, they take the nutrients, can they turn other things into vampires still? It, it's an interesting query. I mean, I'd say since we're talking about having, so still having moments when they're weakest, perhaps they have to come out of the suits to turn someone in, because they still have to directly bite someone. So therefore, when they be at their weakest is when they're actually turning another person into a vampire, which raises, if the players discover this... Yeah. 
it's an interesting maybe they have to step out of the suit in entirety and be like their normal sort of human <laughs> self so sorry so if you've um, if you've got them sort of having to come out of the suit entirely to turn someone into vampire you've got an interesting dilemma if the players find it out if you're trying to take down a particular vampire do you let them feed yeah. feed and turn someone into a vampire so effectively you're sacrificing a person just so that you can have a crack at, at killing this vampire with all the sort of morality questions that that involves are there any morality questions with killing a vampire well no I mean the morality in terms of letting them turn another person into a vampire are there any morality questions there uh, well, yeah, of course. It depends on your dynamic of the game. Uh, in my imagination, I mean, that far in the future, we've probably realised, or we've probably just made life a resource. We're already at the stage where we can clone. Um, so here's a question. You're playing a game 500,000 years in the future. What's your technology like? So taking today as a starting point and slapping on a few hundred thousand years of discovery and evolution. You look at the acceleration we've had of technology very recently. Um, in the future, what does that technology look like? Um, and there's so many ways that you can go with it. But bring it sort of back to topic. If you're playing long-term campaign, you've got a whole sequence of events that you might want to play out before you get to a final scene. Getting to that final scene, you're going to have NPCs along the way. Do you litter the pavement with plot? Or are you, do you looking for players to do self-discovery? Or are you just going to shoehorn some plot in as and when you get the chance? I um, think a lot of that depends, to be honest, on the, the type of players you've got, really. I mean, if you've got people who are sort of happy to wander around and find the plot themselves and sort of be proactive and jump on it and go with that, which I know from experience, I know myself I'm and you are. Yeah. Y you know me, yeah. I, I, I'm on plot like a bloodhound as soon as I like get get the scent of it. But um, if you've got like more reactive or less proactive <laughs> players, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you've got less sort of proactive people, then maybe do you want to like make the plot a bit more obvious, sort of litter litter more plot in there so they'll at least pick up on some of it, or it, make it more linear. Um, the the whole like, we we spoke earlier about metamorphosis. Uh, supernaturals um, and by supernatural I don't just mean vampires and werewolves and mummies and wraiths and anything else written by World of Darkness um, I, I mean anything which is over the, stronger than the natural, it is outside of the natural, it's supernatural you know if it's faster than other things stronger than other things etc um, but anyway uh, there's, there's always sort of a, a metamorphosis of, of something from one point into another. If you're going to have a linear plot, whereabouts in that plot do your characters exist? So, John and I often have a conversation about types of role-play game that we perhaps like to do, that we don't normally get the chance to do. And uh, I was proposing the other day, how about playing it from the position of a group of mooks? So you are a group of mooks for hire. You're hired by various like bad guys, supervillains, whatever it might be. Uh, you're the token red shirts, but you work as a group and see how many sessions you can survive as, as the minions. Uh, take a chance to beat up the righteous people. Because at the end of the day, uh, people go on about uh, their alignment. So I know in a lot of games you'll find words like chaos, order, good, evil. Um, does that actually matter? Because that's all subjective to your characters. Um, I think in, I think in terms of alignment, is it's been used because it's a convenient game terminology, really, isn't it? Well, yeah, they're both sides of the same coin, though. Oh yeah, I agree. Yeah. What always what always strikes me, and again, we've we've had this uh, debate in the past, um, but I'll use some historical examples. Genghis Khan. Is he uh, a rapist, a mur murder, murderer, a marauder, a rampager, or did he unite an entire nation beneath him, uh, organise an empire uh, which was uh, twice the size 
uh, I believe, the, the Roman Empire. No, four times the size of the Roman Empire, twice yeah. the size of that of Alexander the Great. Um, and brought education to um, children. That was one of the, the, the things that he did. He brought education and said that youngsters should be educated. Um, so it, it, if you look at two things from two sides of the same coin... It's all a matter of perspective, really, isn't Exactly. It? If you were playing in a role-play game as uh, a group of uh, uh, Mongolian marauders, then to you, obviously, he's going to be the uh, epitome of... Uh, a leader, a warrior, etc. Good things to look up to. But if you were playing one of the Chin or Chinese people trembling in your fort, the the sight of the, uh, the the tents being erected on the hill, um, then he was obviously a bad person. Um, it's quite often you get that that difference where if you're someone on the inside of an organisation or within the sort of entourage of a, a historical person, for example, looking out. You have one view, whereas if you're on the outside of that, looking in at it, you often have a very different sort of viewpoint. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, everybody's reaction is entirely based upon what their environment is at the time. So if you grow up as a slave in a nation that accepts slavery, you may hate slavery. And an owner of a plantation, for example, just use uh, uh, 19th century America. Southern America is a sort of example. Uh, so you're a plantation owner and you've got all this free labour, uh, but what you're also doing is providing them with board and lodgings and food and perhaps providing education for their children. Do you look at slavery as a bad thing or do you actually think, oh, I'm doing a good thing? You know, these people would be slaves elsewhere because I treat my slaves well. And then another person who owns slaves may look at you and think, oh, but you're going to create an uprising because you treat your slaves too well. You give them these big ideas. I'm actually doing the right thing by not doing that. And you can play the three different types of people and all have a perfectly laudable to them point of view. Well, it's, it's, I've, made the, I've made the point in one, one of my other videos where I'm talking about how to make a, a villain. And I say in that video that... One of the best ways to make a villain is not to think of them as a villain. Absolutely. Because because rarely rarely anyone starts out going, yes, today I am going to be the evil villain. Yeah. They normally start out with what they see as perfectly laudable and explainable and rational goals, and it's only later on people from the outside looking at them where it conflicts with sort of um, conventional morality or other people's ideas that they then have that label of villain applied to them. So if you to use a fantasy analogy, if you're the if you're some necromancer who goes, oh, I'm going to make this ritual that's going to turn all of the, the people in this kingdom into undead, under my sort of control, you may look at it and think, oh, well, I've, I've been a lich for like 200 years. I'm effectively immortal. I'm free of disease. I'm free of time. I can just spend all of my hours dedicated to pursuing cerebral pursuits. And if I make everyone into undead under my control, I'll let them get on with their thing, but I can prevent any crime, any murder. You may see that as perfectly logical. However, if you're like the heroes or the peasants or the, the current king of the kingdom, going, oh, well, we quite like our lives just the way they are. We don't want to all be like undead serving this lich. Obviously, as far as you're concerned, yeah, villain. Villain. But he didn't jump out of his like skeletal bed that morning thinking, all right, today, I am the villain. He didn't wake up, open up his A board with his plans, turn over a fresh page and write evil plan and underline it. He probably just wrote plan. <laughs> <laughs> but it also gives you the element, uh, the idea that somebody doesn't know they're doing evil and then having it represented to them is again another journey that a character could go on because what makes a hero is needing to be redeemed. Which is why we give you some ideas of this in popular culture. Han Solo, is he a villain or is he a hero? Well, he's a smuggler, isn't he? By anybody's stretch of the imagination. Well, yeah, by, by definition of imperial yeah. law at the time, he's, he's a, villain. a villain. Absolutely. Um, he also doesn't give himself wholly to the rebellion cause. He does in the end. Yeah, he starts off as a sort of more mercenary figure, doesn't he? He's concerned with himself. But they value him much more highly because he refused to at the beginning... So the idea that a character suddenly appreciates what they've been doing is, is wrong. They've been shown the light. 
Uh, yeah, so they've been shown this divining light of what they think had this epiphany, and now they're dedicating their lives perhaps against what they've done in the past. I'll give another popular culture example, Schindler in Schindler's List. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, 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 an anti um, uh, an anti-hero. Um, so if you're going to play a villain, yeah, don't don't make them a villain. If they are a villain and they know they're doing wrong, what's what's driving them to do that? The way the way I talk about it in my other videos, I say that um, if you want to make some, the idea of the video is how to make a villain that your players will actually hate and want to work against. And I say most often the way the players will define them as a villain is because the their goals oppose the player character exactly. goals, or they threaten something that the player characters value. So they say, oh yeah, he's a villain because he's doing this. However, the villain may well, should, as far as I'm concerned, have what they see as perfectly legitimate reasons for all of their actions. They don't just go, oh, I'm going to wipe out this to, like, nows the players off. They're doing it to further their own aims. And does your villain have to be an individual? Oh, no. So it can be an organisation, yeah. uh, a company. It can be a statute. It can be the legal service. It could be a group of marauders. It could be a band of merry men. It could be the people you normally are the good guys. Well, just to give you um, an example that, that I've used in my, my Dungeon World Dark Sun game recently, which I, and I spoke to you about fairly recently, the, the tribe of um, Thrykreen Mantis Men. Oh who, yeah, vampire who, locusts. <laughs> who are... <laughs> Who are in? They're in the desert. They're a, a small tribe, and they're guarding this large obsidian hand that's reaching out of the the sand. And it's supposed to be the father of giants, who's effectively like in a magical coma. Now, what they're doing is he just put speech marks round. Supposed to be. Oh yeah, all right. Su supposed to be. Blatantly and, is. And what what they're um, they're saying is that any use of magic in the surrounding area, because the father of giants cannot feed on magic, could restore him and obviously they don't want to see this huge behemoth sort of striding the land smashing everything before it so they've been like killing anyone who gets within range of this statue just to be like, on the safe side now you might look at them as a player and say oh well we've stumbled across this statue and now they're trying to kill us villains hold on can I just popularize popular culture that you've got the example of the guardians in the mummy films uh, the guardians of uh, Hamonaptera or whatever yeah. it's called uh, so they're shown as villains at the start because they're tagging him and trying to stop him from getting there. Uh, you've got the Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End, is it, story? The most recent one, I think it is, uh, where the blood is spilt in the uh, Fountain of uh, fountain of Youth area and it completely... Uh, Atlantis uh, in a Monty Python film, I forget which one, where a drop of blood uh, gets, gets spilt. So there are... There are lots of popular culture precedents in a number of scenario settings um, which do have that group of people who are perceived as villains, like you yep. said, in these Thycreen, these protectors, um, and then the, the perceptions should, should shift. Unless, uh, of course, they're all Nescafe role players, in which case it's FIGHT IT! Well, I mean, as, I, as I'm saying, the, as far as they're concerned, that any player that's stumbling across and oh, they're trying to kill us might think of them as villains initially, as you say. But as far as they're concerned, all right. So, it's, so if we say kill, because bear in mind they're in the middle of a desert. Very rarely people like accidentally come across this um, site. Say they kill twenty, fifty people a year. Just like give it like a fairly big number. It's probably less than that. But say they kill fifty people a year. But by killing those 50 people a year, they're stopping this huge behemoth rising which could stride the, the world just like with a wave of its hand like killing like hundreds of people. So as far as they're concerned, that's perfectly justifiable and the ends justify the means. I think that's another thing that's very important with villains. They do tend to be the ends justify the means. Do, oh, so is it better to choose 50 people than have, say, 300 sacrificed randomly? What gives you the right to choose those people? Just as a potential protagonist there, choosing people, I see what you're doing, less people are going to die, but that makes us murderers, whereas it makes the other people victims. Well, I suppose that's the, that's the thing. That I think part of what defines a, a villain is the willingness to make that choice and, and have that sort of mentality where they believe that they've got the right to make that choice, as you say. Like I said, a normal person might um, 
uh, a non-villain, just to use a convenient label, might sort of debate that a lot. Whereas I think um, someone who it's will the, be it's the Wicker Man, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, they're greater good. They're greater good. Uh, I'm not going to do an ass slap dance for you though. Um, on this, I, I don't believe there are any Daleks in the Wicker Man either. Really. <laughs> um, yeah, so the greater good does that outweigh the price. Yeah, the the, the, the price. So uh, to use a fantasy genre sort of uh, stereotype idiom um, is the king's daughter being sacrificed to the dragon, or the queen's daughter being sacrificed to the kraken, or etc. Somebody undertaking a sacrifice to appease a god or a creature. Does that make a uh, good role play, or is it perhaps now being used so much that it's difficult to make it appear new? Certainly, sacrificing 50 people to save thousands, millions, etc., uh, that's a much more. What price do you pay one person? I'd be like, yeah, push them. Got this idea of the, the sacrifice. Is there a story in being the people that are sacrificed? Uh, John referenced I like to read historical fiction earlier, and there's a brilliant uh, set of books by Simon Scarrow, which are all about two uh, Roman soldiers who travel the, the globe under under the eagle, so to speak. And in one of the books, um, the cohort they're in gets shamed, and they have to undergo something called decimation. Um, which is where a tenth of the unit is killed by the remaining unit to sh and they get new people in. And the way they chose it was by putting white and black stones in a jar and if you chose a black stone you were stripped, you had a, a day in chains and then you were led through to your friends and your friends and cohorts and fellow soldiers had to beat you to death. Um, quite a nasty punishment, I think you'll agree. Well, one of the soldiers who censored these stories, he picks out one of these stones for decimation. Um, and he's obviously pro army, he's in the army, and, and begins to accept his fate. Uh, and obviously, his guide and mentor says, What are you doing? Get the hell out of here. Um, whereas you, all you'd have heard from me is, ah! Yeah, I, I'd have been hitting the old dusty trail about that point. <laughs> ba, 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 ba. Um, so, yeah. But I thought that there is a story around perhaps these people that are selected. You may be one of these people that nobody believes in the sacrifice. Um, and role play is all about stories. And maybe it begins to answer the question you, you, know, you originally posed. What makes a good role play? I think part of it is wanting to take part in the scenario, wanting to have an outcome uh, or an effect on the outcome of the scenario so if you're not bothered why bother yeah, exactly i mean i think i think for me we're talking about like different viewpoints i think for me what makes a good role play game is partly what you've described uh, wanting to take part in a story and affect the outcome i think part of what makes an ideal role playing game for me is that sort of fusion of different viewpoints to create a different story that people can participate in so i'll say if there's just my viewpoint in a story as the gm then you have a very different story than if I've got five other people all with their own ideas contributing to that story. And I think that whole idea of the sort of the sum of the, its parts being greater than any individual part is what makes role playing compelling for me. Well, I, I enjoy the process of uh, people refer to it as microscoping. I believe it's it's a known way system. Well, yeah, my, my, microscope is a. Um, it is a game that was come up with a system designed for creating a, a, a timeline of events, a sort of fictional history, if you will. Well, it's, this is something I've always done before I was even aware of microscoping. I call it microscoping. Yeah, I just shoehorn some index cards in there. Yeah, you, didn't I? yeah. You just you just got something written down. I've always been a big believer in don't write it down, just put it down. Put down the index card, step away from the dice bag. That's not your dice bag. Uh, what, what strikes me about microscoping is you're fundamentally just trying to establish the backstory to make your plot important. I mean, I think all, um, all the actual microscope game does, it, it gives you that ability. Cause it, it tends to be, not in all games, but it tends to be in most games, 
that you have your history and it's very sort of linear. You move from the start to the end in a sort of logical order, aside from like the odd flashback or whatever, and that's it. Whereas Microscope sort of encourages you to move up and down that timeline and sort of fill in different bits. So it gives you the option to jump about. Yeah, also what microscoping or just thinking detailedly about your game and your plot beforehand does is it gives you the chance to come up uh, with perhaps more genuine NPCs. If you're a GM out there, um, I should imagine you've probably got a jotter somewhere that you've written short stories in. Um, I've certainly not come across a GM yet that hasn't undertaken writing short stories at some point. Or drawing a piece of art that tries to get some idea out of their head onto uh, a page. Now, with enough backstory, that NPC can form part of a very compelling world. But of course, if you've got, if you're a Nescaf role player and you're just going to fight your way through everything that you meet, I think you should probably trademark that lot before we get to the end of this video. To be fair, because I'm so stealing it. Uh, yeah, when you're when you're trying to do a compelling NPC, that NPC can form. So I'll give you a few examples. Lieutenant Gordon in the Batman films, or in the Batman books and comics, right? Lieutenant Gordon is a stable piece of NPC material, as is um, the butler Alfred. Alfred, yeah, yeah. People want to play Batman, they want to play Robin, um, but you want to play the heroes, you don't want to play the furniture, but these furniture exist and make the storyline more compelling. So Poirot has his uh, Inspector Jap, uh, Sherlock Holmes had Lestrade. Um, and Watson, obviously. Well, I, I would class Watson as a player character. I, I, I would, but I'd probably classify him as... Um you know, sometimes, and I've, I watched a video that someone else did about this recently, where they're saying um, um, a, a guy called um, da David Ducker did a video where you he's talking about how sometimes you get a very strong role player who becomes like almost like the main sort of protagonist, and other less strong role players tend to sort of form a supporting cast, as it were. I'd sort of classify Watson as being mainly supporting cast, but he occasionally has those moments where he becomes almost the main protagonist. Well, if you're going to do a campaign game, um, say for example the local mayor, um, you're a group of punk kids who like to skateboard and you like to graffiti stuff, uh, and there's a, a beat policeman who, who sort of when you're younger stops you, and you're a bit of your nemesis, you know, your your officer Dibble, if you will. Um, however, then as you grow up and you become young men. Um, he plants some uh, some marijuana or something in one of your cars, gets one of you sent to prison, gets himself a promotion for it, whatever. Yeah, And then um, later on in the story, so your story may not actually begin perhaps till your businessmen, your, your older established people, and he's the mayor. You observe him like, the, you, you see that the, the underworld is... Is overruled, and you see that the the, the city's running in a really bad way, and you decide like a group of uh, vigilantes in a kick-ass uh, or or Watchmen story. Um, sorry, so you, you turn into this group of vigilantes, and decide to take law into your own hands, and this mayor becomes your nemesis or whatever. That's just you know something off the cuff straight away yeah. flesh it out etc but you see what I mean that's an NPC that you can actually take on their own journey through a campaign I think sometimes you uh, almost end of level boss styly go through campaigns yeah I mean I'd agree I think um, one of the problems you can have with sort of villains or main NPCs whether they're villains or not is that quite often as you say like an end of level boss there's no real sign of them and then suddenly they appear for like the boss fight at the end, and that that's the only time you see them. Whereas, really, if to use your example of the mayor, you're going to come across evidence of his doings, even if you never directly meet him during the <laughs> campaign. You might hear about a um, a, a policy that is enacted, like an anti graffiti exactly. policy or something like that. Uh, and even if it's like a, a fantasy or a futuristic game, I think. Certainly, you should probably start start off coming across sort of like sub lieutenants of the 
your main sort of villain or your main sort of antagonist beforehand and before even you come across the sub lieutenant so evidence that they have left of like actions they have undertaken in the game so to use your mayor example you might come across a um, a city planner who's under the mayor's thumb and he's sort of used him as a backdoor to get some new legislation pushed through and you, you have a you have a bit, a bit of a throw down with this city planner and that leads you on to discovering other things that the mayor has been shadily involved in and you've never actually met the mayor up until this point but you know he exists by the sort of the footprint he's left behind him, really. Okay, slightly more sinister. Uh, okay. Your mayor's anti-graffiti campaign. Uh, for years, the homeless have communicated about places where they can get food, places where they can get shelter, by leaving marks behind, be it carved into trees, benches, etc. This is a, a unknown thing. Perhaps the mayor is actually having this anti-graffiti campaign, and what he's doing is systematically going through those and herding people from the homeless and using them for some evil plan, be it always. I don't know, if you like Doctor Who, perhaps he like is ruled by the cyber controller and he's actually leading these homeless people off to be cybermen. I don't know. Perhaps if you like a vampire game, he's preparing some army of ghouls to like attack somebody well, else. Maybe he's herding them to be fed up on by yeah. a vampire response. I mean to take it even more sinisterly. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps um perhaps what he's doing is he's actually selectively enacting the anti graffiti legislation in certain areas effectively forcing them only to graffiti in other areas yeah, yeah. as part of some like occult ceremony or ritual of something. He's trying to give it a sort of Cthulhu sort of... A sacrifice bent. to a hellmouth perhaps. He's aware that uh, a certain cave in... A certain group of woods perhaps has recently become inhabited by a demonic spectre that he's in service to and he's sending the homeless over into that direction as food. And if you want to play a character in this world, uh, perhaps a disgruntled ex-army veteran who's just found himself on the streets you see it going on perhaps your group is a couple of sandwich givers just a couple of ordinary people investigators to, if you like it to flip it round um, to flip it round from this sort of did that whole inside looking out perspective perhaps you're a sort of low level functionary in the city planning office you sort of tumbled onto some of the slightly more sort of quasi-legal sort of back routes they'd used to enact this legislation and you raised it with your supervisor and the next thing you know you suddenly find yourself without a job and you've been shuffled yeah, out to the shuffled office. Shuffled out, yeah. It absolutely. doesn't give you any major leg up since you only like tumbled onto the very start of it but it gives you a reason to get involved with it straight away. Oh, oh perhaps your way in is you buy a, a copy of the big issue uh, once a week on your way to work on, on the tube or perhaps you regularly see a homeless guy and his dog and you always buy the dog a chicken leg and him a coffee or, or something like that. If you want to read a source material and actually would enjoy playing this game I'd recommend Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere. Uh, yeah, very good. Very good. It's a fantastic, just perhaps a bit maybe a different direction to take it. Um, but looking at what's important to those people, your commodities then might change from. Uh, so you hear your, your Dungeons and Dragons esque commodities are your gold coin, aren't they? Well, your yeah, tales of, so. of dare do to swap. Uh, whereas this could actually just be a warm bath and a bed for a night. Um, you could create some system, some antagonistic system, uh, for some sort of obfuscate type power in public places because you're a homeless person. Well, yeah, I mean, you could to, just to, blend into the background. To, to bring it back to talking about Neverwhere, there's a whole thing, isn't there, where once you've been into London mm. below and it's accepted you, the people of London above, i.e., the normal world, no longer really perceive you. They just go, oh, it's just some like homeless guy, and they don't really look at you. They just sort of like, they're, they're, their gaze just sort of washes over you. Oh, yeah. Which, to be fair, some of us spent months of role play in systems like vampire and werewolf, etc., trying to earn the XP for the gift or, or discipline or whatever it might be to give me that cloak of invisibility that you could probably buy for twenty gold coins in any tavern. Um, I, 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 I think that'd be a bit of a, a bit of a sort of poor D and D game from my point of view. We can just walk into a tavern and oh well, I get you uh, a uh, whiner invisibility cloak. Magical artifacts? No, but no, but would it? Would it? Because say you're playing yeah. a camp. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa! Hear me <laughs> out, people. Don't don't edit me, John. Don't edit me. Right. So you're pl John. So you're playing uh, a campaign. You're absolutely right. You walk in at the start. Oh, here's a tavern. Oh, you buy some ales and you buy a, a ring of invulnerability. Oh, 
brilliant. If you were playing a one-off though, and you as a GM designed a set of artifacts, which say you design nine of them and you know that five of them you're going to allow players to have, but so you give them all powers, and then in a we, we referenced, or rather I referenced Final Fantasy earlier, you then walk into a shop at the start of your role play. Uh, like, what was the, the, the was it Diablo where you went down and down and down yeah, to different so, yeah. levels of of uh, the underworld and came back up and sold your stuff? That could actually make so so you design a list and say there's different ways this one-off can go you've got to go and save the the princess from the tower there's the journey there's the red wizard um, here's a list of nine artefacts you walk into the shop call him oh my god <laughs> <laughs> no! uh, do you know that sunlight is eight minutes away from where we are um, so yeah but you then have a list of magical items and your players have something in their hand to begin with see it's one off my my, my my sort of issue with that isn't the f- giving people equipment to start off because i think i think for a one-off game i think that's perfectly fine like say you want to have cool equipment and to be able to use your abilities because it's a one-off game and you want rope you always up- takes people to take one thing away from this video please always get rope, rope. yeah I think um, my issue is with the sort of like the delivery method of the artifacts. I think if I was going to give someone some artifacts, what I'd do is I'd work with them from the start with their sort of like brief backstory to say like, oh, you can have this artifact if you can justify how you've come across it in your background, which seems to me a lot more. Oh, really? Seems, seems to me a lot, a lot more <laughs> evo- evocative than just um, you walk into a bar and like, want to buy an invisibility cloak. No, but it, here's a question with your one-off. Is it a one-off if it takes a session to set your characters up, to generate your characters, before you can role-play with them? Or is it a one-off, you walk in, you generate, you play, you leave? Because if it's the latter, then I'd say your guy at the shop with the magical artefact plugs a good time gap in what could be quite a short way. Well, I'd I'd say, we should probably think about wrapping up soon for this video, but I'd say perhaps that's a topic for our next video. Oh, oh. Talking about one-off games in detail. Do you want us to see us do a rap battle? No, no, that's not a genuine offer. Do you want us to argue about whether or not a game needs dice? Yeah, m- myself, myself and John both have sort of diametrically opposed views when it comes to that, but uh, that's a subject for a future video. So I hope you've all enjoyed our video ramblings on this Sunday. Sunday, we're hoping to make this a semi-regular feature on the web part, since as John says we normally spend Sunday morning rambling about RPGs and RPG related topics so why not record them and share just a little bit of the the madness with you people out there in YouTube land so I hope if you've enjoyed this video you consider clicking on like for it and click on the red dice there to subscribe to the channel if you have any comments put them down below or hit me up in the Google Plus links until we see you next time thank you very much for listening and for watching Thank you from myself, so it's good night from me. And it's good night from me. Take care, everybody.